Our topic today is uh, the Holy Spirit and its figures. I suppose that probably all of us are convinced that the Holy Spirit is not a person. It could not be a person. And before we discuss some selected figures, I would like to give some general thoughts about it. We notice that the term Holy Spirit has two general biblical meanings. First, God's power. And second, God's disposition. God's disposition, which means his mental, moral and religious character. I will give one scripture uh, each. The first, the Holy Spirit as God's power. Uh, let's read Luke chapter first, uh, 1 and uh, 35, the first part of this verse, Luke 1, 35. I will read from the New King James Version, most of the verses I uh, would like to uh, read from New King James Version. And the angel answered and said to her, the angel, the angel Gabriel, spoke to Mary, of course, in Hebrew, and he said, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will come up on you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. The brethren, we are dealing here with Hebrew poetry, which is called parallelism. Parallelism. It is made by repeating the same thought, but in different words. And therefore, the expression, the Holy Spirit will come up on you, means the same as the power of the highest will overshadow you. Then, hence, we can say the first meaning of the term Holy Spirit is God's power. Second, the Holy Spirit as God's disposition. Let's read Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. There shall come forth a road from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And now, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. The brethren, Isaiah explained here the expression spirit of the Lord. It is the Holy Spirit of Jehovah. It is his wise disposition, rightly perceiving and reasoning. It is a disposition that gives good advice a disposition that has strength of will and is proficient in the knowledge of divine things. A disposition that is full of reverence, justice and love toward God. Hence, the second meaning, we can say the second meaning of the term Holy Spirit is God's disposition. But this meaning refers not only to God himself, but also to the divine disposition in Jesus Christ, of whom uh, the, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah spoke here, and of course to all other consecrated beings, angels and uh, men. Several figures contained in the Bible demonstrate that the Holy Spirit in God's people is his disposition in them. And for today's talk, I have chosen only four of them. Let's get started. The first figure that symbolizes the Holy Spirit, we will study here today, is that of a dove. A dove. I think we all associate this symbol very well, and our Lord's water baptism in the Jordan River was followed by the Spirit begetter. And let's read 
now together Luke chapter 3, 21 and 22. Although all Gospels speak about this event, uh, we, we read from, from Luke 3, 21, 22. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him and a voice came from heaven which said, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. This figure, the brethren, has of course its um, own peculiar significance and doesn't represent all not uh, doesn't represent all the qualities of the Holy Spirit. Since uh, the Second World War, the dove is usually associated as a symbol of peace, but in the Bible, it is used to represent especially the spirit of truth and love. The dove breeders know that some of their traits are marital fidelity and affection. I will quote a one sentence from Wikipedia, a one sentence only. Fidelity of a pair of doves inspired human sympathy. Fidelity of a pair of doves. It's mean without human intervention, the doves themselves would not change partner. So we see that the dove brings to our attention the constant, faithful and tender love. And I mean, it is a very fittingly picture of the spirit of love as it existed in Jesus Christ. Jesus love, the brethren, for people is constant and unchanging. He proved it by fulfilling his duties and privileges toward us. Uh, neither sorrow, nor suffering, nor opposition, and even a shameful death turned Jesus away from his faithfulness to us. He showed deep compassion to those who were weak, who were out of the way. And we remember how he treated the lame and the blind and how he dealt with those who were crying after the loss of their loved ones. However, the strongest love Jesus showed and still shows to his faithful followers. And we read John chapter 13, verse 1, at the beginning of the Passover. John 30, verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So we see in summary, we can see, say that the figure of a dove indicates that the Holy Spirit in Jesus was the holy divine disposition of love in him, in Jesus. So move on, let's move on. The cloven tongues is the next biblical figure symbolizing the Holy Spirit. Uh, I think we are familiar with this symbol as well. And we remember the Jewish feast of Pentecost and the spirit begetting of the first members of the church. We will read Acts chapter 2 and verses 2, 3, and 4. Acts 2, 2, 3, and 4. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues of, as of fire, 
and one set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We see that a flame of the fire appeared in the room, which was immediately divided into fiery tongues. This sat most likely only upon the apostle alone, the brethren, although the text doesn't say this explicitly. The tongue. The tongue in biblical symbolism is used to represent other thoughts, teachings, doctrines, whether true or false. If we present true teachings, we bring life. If we present false teachings, we bring death. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. We can read it in Proverbs 18, 21. But what does fire represent? We usually associate this symbol with sharp trials or destruction. However, there are also other figurative meanings of fire, such as the enlightenment of God's word. As the pillar of uh, fire leading the Israelites in the wilderness or as the burning lamps from Revelation. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. These seven lamps of fire symbolize the seven biblical, biblical lines of thought. Of thought. We know uh, all of them. Doctrines, uh, precepts, promises, exhortations, prophecies, histories and types. Seven lamps of fire, seven spirits, seven biblical lines of thought. They are all for the enlightenment of God's people and mankind in all. And let's go, uh, go back now to the cloven tongues of fire. The tongues as a symbol of doctrine or teaching and fire as a symbol of enlightenment should suggest the idea that enlightenment through truth was the office work of the Holy Spirit in church, in the church. Of course, the enlightenment was mainly the work of the apostles to the church and to the world. They were the special mount pieces, mount pieces of God and Christ. Thus, the enlightening work of the truth is symbolized by the Holy Spirit as tongues of fire. Of course, we can say, uh, in a sense, this symbol can also apply to the rest of the church. It was uh, their divine disposition. It was their holy mind heart and will uh, that manifested the spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, having uh, educating and enlightening influence. The next biblical symbol of the Holy Spirit is a seal, a seal. In the next uh, scriptures, uh, we will read Two figures uh, will be mentioned, but we will deal uh, with them step by step. At first seal and then the other one. Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Now, he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts. This is the first figure, he sealed us. And as a guarantee, this is the second uh, figure. Uh, I said, I read uh, usually from the uh, New King James Version. The King James Version said, earnest, as a earnest. 
We can also read uh, Ephesians, Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, the first figure, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, the second one, uh, uh, in King James, we read uh, earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So the Apostle Paul tell, tells us that the Holy Spirit is the seal with which, with which God's people in the gospel age were sealed. There were two types of sealing referred to them. First, the seal in on or on the forehead. Uh, we can read it in Revelation chapter 7, but this is not our topic today. And second, the seal in or on the heart. And the seal in the heart indicated that someone has already attained a certain degree of God's disposition. At this level of development, the individual has come into full harmony with the divine will, with his word and his providences. At what point in an individual's life this took place, we can't say. But perhaps after once attained the degree of perfect love, but before that love was tested and the calling was made sure, maybe in between of them both. The Holy Spirit as an imprinted seal in the heart of the church showed the expression of God's working in them. And in the Bible, seals are used for three purposes. First, as a means of sec securing a thing from interference. We know the Romans sealed the stone of Christ's tomb. And regarding the church, we use this meaning of seal in the sense of their being secure in Christ. Being secure in Christ, this doesn't mean that they couldn't fall, but in the sense that as they continued in that sealed condition, they were kept safe from falling. The seal as a means of approving, second, second, as a means of approving of uh, the authenticity of a document, for example, a royal edict. And regarding the church, we use this meaning of seal in the sense of they being sanctioned by God and confirmed and strengthened in his special favor. God gave them various kinds of evidence of his approval, being sanctioned by God. And the third meaning as a means of keeping something secret as in the case of the seven seals on the book in Revelation. But in regard to the church, we use this meaning of seal in the sense of their being kept in the secret place, being kept in the secret place. They were hidden with Christ under God's special protection beyond the reach of the word which couldn't understand them or do them any spiritual harm. Let's read Psalm 91 verses 1 to 4. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. 
he shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. So we can see if the Holy Spirit is the seal in the sense that the church was secured by God, had his special favor, approval and protection. It is no wonder that they were in harmony with God's will, were joyfully submitted to it, and were, of course, well pleasing to God. And that was indeed the holy divine disposition in them. So move on to the last one. The last figure of the Holy Spirit, of course, which we would like to consider here together may be called earnest, as in King James Version, or guarantee, as in New King James Version, or down payment. Brother Johnson wrote that earnest were uh, usually wrote, um, used in Old English, uh, and the modern term should be a hand payment, a hand payment, but I couldn't find a right definition of hand payment. Okay, but we read in the previous scriptures in Ephesians, that the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the earnest of our inheritance. And we can add uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and first 5, 2 Corinthians 5 and 5. I will read now from the old King James Version. Now, he that had wrought us for the self same thing is God, who also had given unto us the earnest of the Spirit, the guarantee of the earnest of the Spirit. The brethren, if we are going to buy something expensive, an item or, a, mm, I don't know, property, uh, we agree on conditions and usually including a down payment. This contract binds, of course, both parties. We, as the buyer, have to make this down payment and the seller have to give us a receipt for it. And this act shows that both are in earnest on this transaction and therefore earnest. The buyer, of course, uh, the buyer must pay the difference in due time and the seller is obliged to hand over the purchased item or property and, of course, in the end, the title of the ownership. In our scriptures, St. Paul called the Holy Spirit of promise, the earnest, the hand payment. And what is it? We remember the promises of the Abrahamic covenant, and especially the tree that developed the spirit begotten class, Genesis chapter 22. First, becoming as the stars of heaven. Second, possessing of the gates of their enemies. And third, participating of blessing of mankind. God promised the new creature to give them first his nature, which means not only divine body, but also God like character, his disposition. Second, a victory over their enemies. And third, join hership with Christ in rulership and blessing others. These three things were guaranteed to the faithful followers of Jesus Christ in gospel age as their eventual, eventual possession. But the new creatures received already in their earthly life an earnest of the promised possession. This is the Holy Spirit and it means that they could become in their disposition as stars of heaven, they could develop their characters in the likeness of the divine character of Jesus. And it included, of course, also that such character helped them to overcome their own enemies, sin, error, selfishness, and worldliness, as they were activated against them. 
in this life, God didn't give them the divine body, nor did he give them general victory over enemies, as they are in the world in all, uh, uh, about death or devil, nor did God give them the kingdom, rulership and blessing of all nations. These parts of the promises were given to them later. The transfer of this inheritance didn't take place until the first resurrection. And because these partial payment were promises of the development of God's character and present victory over their personal enemies, we see that Apostle Paul rightly called it the earnest of the spirit, which means the holy God's disposition in his people. The brethren, our time has now come to the end. As I mentioned at the beginning, there are many symbols of the Holy Spirit. Today, I could present only four of them, dove, cloven tongues, seal and earnest. And I hope these thoughts were helpful and blessed for all of us. Thank you for your attention and for having me. God bless these thoughts. Thank you.